All right, hi everybody. Thanks for coming out and joining us today. Uh, my name is Kevin Chipman, and I work at United Way of Winnipeg. Um, when we're just kind of in the midst of wrapping up our annual campaign this year, uh, with the goal of raising $21 million, and we're kind of in the home stretch. Um, United Way supports a network of over 100 local not-for-profits, um, kind of in three focus areas. The first one being uh, helping kids be all that they can be, our youth focus areas. So those are before and after school programs that offer kids things like homework clubs, recreation programming, sports and cultural programming, counseling and mentorship opportunities. Uh, our second focus area is around inspire, uh, moving people from poverty to possibility. Uh, so those are agencies that help people with things like job skills, money management, training, uh, launching social enterprise opportunities, uh, and match savings programs towards the purchase of meaningful assets for low-income families. Um, and then our third focus area, which is kind of the focus area that I think we're going to be kind of shining a spotlight on today, is around inspiring healthy people and stronger communities. Um, the healthy people component is uh, United Way funds agencies that support over 20,000 Manitobans living with uh, a disability or diagnosed condition. That can be a physical disability, but also a mental disability as well. Um, and then our second uh, focus area is around uh, inspiring healthy communities. And so those are supporting things like neighborhood uh, family resource centers and women's resource centers, uh, and also supports for newcomers and refugees. So today, uh, we have a fabulous speaker from one of our over 100 agencies, uh, the CNIB. The CNIB is actually one of United Way's original uh, agency partners, so they have been funded by United Way since we started back in 1965, and they've existed long before that. Uh, so this is Veronica. Veronica has retired early from two careers, which sounds very nice, in <laughs> December, last week before the university closes. Uh, she was a biologist for 13 years. Uh, with the government of Manitoba, and then she was a life coach and hypnotherapist uh, on, as a sideline. Uh, today she volunteers for the Canadian National Institute for the Blind on their advisory board, and as a spokeswoman, champion advocate, and youth mentor. Uh, Veronica is also a die-hard martial artist uh, for the last 20 years, and she is now training in I'm going to say this right, Bisset Jiu-Jitsu. Correct. An effective and practical Canadian military self-defense system based on real-life situations. And she's finally training to receive her basic self-defense instructor certificate. Uh, so that would be within her reach, hopefully. That's her, kind of her New Year's goal for 2019, is Correct. to be a certified uh, self-defense instructor. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to my much more interesting colleague today, <laughs> Veronica. <laughs> Don't exaggerate, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, how is everyone tonight? Mind you, it's not tonight yet, it's just 12, but you know, <laughs> depends where you live in the world, right? Um, thank you very much for having me here today and uh, to hear my story. I'm representing the United Way of Winnipeg through their affiliation of the CNIB, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, as Kevin says. And that's because I've been, yes, now I'm volunteering, I'm wearing several hats with them. And I want to give back, and one of the newest programs that actually we're looking at is setting up self-defense for the blind and visually impaired um, through the Manitoba Blind Sports Association. So it's a really, really exciting opportunity to share this, uh, this amazing life skill with other people. But the reason why I'm involved with the CNIB in the first place is because I become a client of theirs. 20 years ago. Unwillingly so, but, <laughs> but I had no choice. I had no choice at the time. And so you understand, for you to understand where I'm coming from and for you to really get the story, imagine, imagine just for a minute what it would be like. You're 23 years old, you're halfway through your university degree whatever your passion is for, you're about halfway through. It's December, and I think you guys can probably relate more than anyone else, but you know, it's December. You're about five days or so before your first midterm exam. And um, you wake up and you sit down, you sit down at your desk and you're looking at your notes, and you don't know what's wrong. You actually don't know what's wrong. You can't make sense of your notes. 
so you keep on procrastinating, like I'm sure nobody else does. <laughs> I'm sure I was the only one, right? <clears throat> Go to the bathroom, get a cup of coffee, come back, stare at your notes. They're still not making any sense. Let's, you know, or well, maybe tea will help. So, you know, <laughs> come back, stare at your notes. <laughs> You know, oh, I think the dog needs to go outside. So you keep on coming back and it's not, make, it's not making any sense. Well, finally you realize what's going on. And um, going back a little bit, turns out that this summer previous, you had two eye surgeries in your right eye because your retina has detached due to childhood type 1 diabetes that you had since you were six years old. You had two surgeries, none of them worked. And as a matter of fact, you're three days before you have your very first own prosthetic shell that goes over what is the remainder of your right eye. Three days and about five days before the first midterm exam. And you realize what happened. And your retina has detached in your left eye. And you just can't make sense of the small print. So naturally, I was devastated. I was absolutely floored and devastated. And who I was and what made me who I was at the time, who I thought, you know, this is me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> friends, fashion, heels, <laughs> shoes, <laughs> nice purses, right? Going out, socializing, and school. I was going to university, and you know, I was an okay student. <laughs> you know, party perhaps came first, but uh, sometimes. But I did study. I studied hard. So I could not. For me, there was just no future. It was like it was cut off. I couldn't see myself. You know, obviously school was done. I can't even read my notes. How am I gonna, you know, this is zoology, microbiology, you know, all the basics. It's not making any sense. I, and I can't grab my keys and sit into my little pony Hyundai and um, <laughs> go off somewhere wherever I want to. Now, this is horrible. I felt like my life was really, really over. I saw no hope. And um, I remember there was one, there was actually one time, one night um, where I let myself break down and I let myself cry and I was sitting in bed and I was holding myself and I was crying and yeah, I was down. And um, understandably so. And what happened is that the radio was on in the back and there's this song by Mariah Carey called Hero. And I don't know if you guys know the words, but I have never really paid attention to it. You know, it's a nice song. Never paid attention to the words or what they mean. But then I heard her say, you know, then a hero comes along with the strength to carry on. And so I started crying more because my boyfriend at the time, who, of course, I thought he was the love of my life. And please, you know, <laughs> the first of many, right? <laughs> anyways, it's a serious, yeah, anyways. Um, so I'm like crying even more, and I'm sobbing, you know, while he's leaving, he's going to another city to do his master's thesis. You know, he's leaving me behind. So I'm crying even harder. More words. I hear more words, um, such as, and now you have to go through life all alone, and no one reaches you, no one reaches out a hand for you to hold. So I'm crying even more, and I'm like, yeah, this is a horrible song. <laughs> this is taking you into dark places. Why, why, why do people like those dark places and write such beautiful songs about it? I didn't quite get it. But anyway, so I'm crying really, really hard. And then the rest of the words seep in, which is then you finally see the truth that a hero lies in you. And interestingly enough, it was such a transformational moment for me that I sat up and my, my hands came down. I was like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. I just, I just knew that. And I don't know where that came from. I cannot tell you if it was my dad who planted the seed when he was telling me about Tarzan when I was a little girl. <laughs> you know, his stories about surviving by himself in the jungle. Or was it a book that I read by Bruce Lee when I was about eight or nine years old that was translated into Hungarian? 
I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I just knew that to be true. And it ended up being such a transformational moment for me that I pretty much turned around and I took advantage of every single service that the CNIB had to offer. I did their, they have a transitioning system, a transitioning support group where people who recently lose their eyesight, you go through and you talk about the grief, you know, the process of grief, like what happens when you lose something or someone, you know, the pain, the anger, the denial. Um, individual one-on-one -on -one counseling where they told me exactly what I needed to hear. Mobility counseling, uh, not mobility counseling, I'm sorry, uh, mobility lessons. Because when you can't see, when your sight is down any bit, or at this point I have nothing, I have no eyesight at all, it's, um, the little things become a really huge challenge, like transportation. You know, how do you, how do you go out there shopping? You can do it, it can be done, most likely with the help of a lot of other people. And you can get around, you can get a guide dog, you can go through the training. Um, now that I'm in between dogs, last year in between service dogs, last year I spent about three months uh, here at the Health Sciences Center getting trained with the cane again. And I mean, the building has changed so much, you know, <laughs> as they're always fixing and changing something. So, but now I know with the cane how to get in at the William entrance and make it all the way to the lab and go up to the transplant unit and then come back down to the lab and even get a cup of coffee on the way out. And uh, yeah, I, I was, I mean, that's, that's a huge step for me to be able to do that without my dog. It's amazing. Um, and it's just, I know, I know, it, it's actually, it's, I know, I know a lot of people tell me that they themselves, they get lost. They get lost at Health Sciences Center and uh, the worst thing I've done is I trip people with my cane <laughs> and I hit them as they're sitting on the, <laughs> on the chairs. So <laughs> I'm just going, you know, I'm going, sorry, sorry about that. Like, sorry. <laughs> a little tired of saying sorry. But anyways, um, so I just, I threw myself into every service that they had available. I learned how to use a speech program called JAWS, which is a screen reader program. And in about a year's time, actually about a year later, a year, this was in January of 1997. Oh my God. So if you calculate quickly, that's, that makes me 29. And <laughs> <laughs> so I was back in uh, 1999, January, starting back in school. I was back in university. And with the help of CNIB, I was able to graduate a few years later with an environmental science degree. I switched over. I made it so I didn't lose all those credits that I spent in sciences. And I got a job with the government. I, got, I had a job straight out from university. I ended up working for the wildlife branch, for parks and natural areas, for pollution prevention branch, right up my alley. It was really, really amazing. <coughs> I started martial arts the year after my retina has detached. Um, and then when I lost the rest of my eyesight, I started doing Aikido. Um, martial arts was one of those things that just really worked for me. So I basically went out there and I just, you know, grabbed life by the horn, as they say, <laughs> just, I just did it. I sold my car and I bought a used piano and I took piano lessons for a year. <laughs> it was a used car, so, you know, <laughs> that's all I could get for it. Um, but that didn't stick, but hey, you know, I gave it a try. And so I could have done a lot of these things, maybe, maybe without the help of such an organization like the CNIB, but I could have never, I would have not be able to afford all the, you know, the software program. The laptop, 20 years ago, all that equipment, it cost about $11,000. It was very, very special equipment and the special software, it was very expensive. So there was no way I could have done that. And without having a job that pays well, well, I could have not, afford all the hobbies that I did. You know, Aikido, martial arts, that takes, you know, some money. There are seminars, there's the uniforms to buy, you have to pay for testing and whatnot. So, and I took, 
I also did a whole bunch of different, well, okay, four different styles of yoga. Um, I tried capoeira. It's a dance martial art. Uh, you dance and you do martial arts. You know, it's a Brazilian one. Um, it didn't work because you need to see for it, but... <laughs> But I gave it a try for about a couple of months. Uh, Zumba didn't work either, by the way. You need to see. Turns out to be. Um, but I went out and I did a whole bunch of things. And I just, I lived life anyways. And now that I'm retired from the government, um, I had a second transplant. I had a kidney transplant about 12 years ago. And then I had, about four years ago, I had a pancreas transplant. Because I said, that's enough, you know, diabetes is just taking everything. Now I have four stents around the heart, you know, it's just things are going downhill. This is not fun. So I signed up for a pancreas transplant and I got it and I'm completely off of insulin. Oh, wow. I know, I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. What you guys do here is actually making a huge difference in people's lives. And so what ended up happening is that I came down with a really bad virus, of course, after the second transplant, you know, that's sort of normal. And it really knocked me off my feet. So I didn't go back to work. I retired. And slowly, slowly, I kept on building myself back up again. And, you know, with a little yoga, I got back into Aikido. And then last year, I found this amazing Beset Jiu-Jitsu system, which it's not even a martial art. It's a life skill. When you know how to defend yourself, um, you learn how to use your body as weapons if needed. And it's a really in-depth, it's a really in-depth intelligence system, by the way. Uh, we teach and we talk about emotional intelligence and self-awareness. So it's not, you know, I mean, it is violent, but you only use it in the last, <laughs> it's your last resource. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. We, we teach and we learn not ever to use what we learn and to be good people, responsible people. In any case, um, you know, it's interesting now as I'm coming out and I'm doing these talks and just look back and it's like, yeah, you know what? I lived a pretty amazing life. I didn't realize this at the time. I just went out and I just did things and that's what I'm still doing. But it's just so much fun. There's just so much fun that you can still have, sight or no sight. And <clears throat> I was very fortunate that about two years into when I was working, for the wildlife branch, Jane Goodall came to town. She had an endangered species exhibit and I was on the committee for that. So of course I was, inv I was invited for the luncheon with Jane Goodall. And I asked her, I asked her, we had a question and answer period. And I asked her, you know, me coming out of just freshly out of university, wanting to change the world. You know, you see all these horrible environmental degradations globally. And I was out there to change the world, of course. And so I asked her, you know, this, this amazing woman who's going around the world and making, she's doing such amazing work. And so what I asked her is, what does she bring to the table that affects change, where she leaves something with people that they end up changing their ways, that she ends up touching, is that, touching them somehow, and she gets the message through, because that was my frustration, you know, this, we should do the right thing, why don't people do the right thing, you know, what are we doing? And she said, it was passion. She said, when you do what you do, and when you speak from passion, people will connect and that will cause an effect and lasting change in people. And no, I'm not even close to Jane Goodall, I know that. Um, but I'm in a phase of my life where I want to give back. You know, I'm not doing this, you know, I'm volunteering, you know, it's not about money. I really want to give back. And volunteering even at the CNIB, it sort of puts my own troubles and my sufferings at the time into a perspective that it has now meaning because now I can really help other people and I can tell them, hey, this is what you can do. This is what has helped me. And from Neuro Linguistic Programming Life Coaching, I know how to communicate really effectively and I know different people need to hear different messages in order to get the point, to get the information through. And so 
when I ask myself, so what is it that I care about? What is it that I'm really passionate about? And I mean, the underlying theme really in the life coaching and hypnotherapy and in Pisa Jiu Jitsu is choices and responsibility. You know, that we always have a choice. It doesn't matter what happens around us. We always, always, always have a choice. And that's very, very empowering. And although that's true, if I really have to ask myself what I really, really, truly, truly care about, it has to be animals. It has to be animals. <laughs> it has to be, you know, not, not just wildlife, not just dogs, but just animals and nature. And you guys have probably seen the science, you know, um, kind and spiritual people, they know that it doesn't need to be science, but an act of kindness. I, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the research, but if I do an act of kindness to any one of you, you know, Yes, my happy hormone levels will shoot right up, but yours will shoot up even more. And anyone watching this interaction, this act of kindness, it just, the happy hormones just shoot right up. We just all become happier, just watching an act of kindness, that's it. And so I think it's one of those actions that it has a ripple effect. Because now you cause someone to have a better day who now ends up going home and I don't know, they're in a better mood, so they end up treating someone else better, their child, their dog, you know, I think it's a ripple effect that somewhere down the line, you know, like the butterfly wing effect, I don't know, you know, some animal is just, someone's going to forgive someone, someone's not going to kick a dog, something along that line. And, um, you know, starting a pledge or giving more, by the way, is one of those kind things that you can do. Because as I'm finding out, the United Way is such an organization that people who work there, they get their wages paid by the government. So any money that goes to them, it goes directly to these over 100 agencies like the CNIB. And obviously I can tell you from experience that they're doing a really, really great job and they have helped me and are helping many other people. So uh, it's a great way of making a strong community. It's like putting it back, putting the energy back into the community where we need it so people can thrive again. So thank you very much for listening. Does anybody have any questions for Veronica? Yeah, any questions? No questions? All right, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I have a question, actually. Okay. First tech, the first program you or software that you were using versus what you're able to use now. You're wondering about the technology. Well, just in terms it's of if how how are you finding are you finding that um, the technology is more affordable, more yes. universally accessible? Is it is it getting is it getting easier? Is it making a difference? Yes and yes and yes, yes and yes and yes. Twenty years ago, um, I'm an I'm an avid reader. I just, I liked reading books, and so I realized I had to switch over to listening books. I tried learning the Braille, but that was just too, I found it too frustrating. So it was very limited. If any books were available even, they were very, very expensive mm -hmm. if the library didn't have them. And that's just books. We're just talking books. Every book I was going, you know, even textbooks, they had to be translated, they had to be converted into electronic forms, you know, someone had to read them and record them. Nothing was available. And now they're more affordable, the price has come down, they're really easy to use. They have apps where I can take a picture of a handwritten letter, a handwritten letter, and it will read it to me. And I can take pictures of, um, yeah, I can take pictures of cans and goods that you buy in the store and it will tell you what it is. It's amazing. It's amazing, the technology. And it's affordable, it's available. And CNIB has a play it forward. No, I'm sorry, not play it, phone it forward. Used smartphones, you can donate. You can drop them off at CNIB and you get a tax receipt. And they refurbish them because unfortunately most 
clients, you know, they happen to be in a situation where they live on minimum disability and they cannot afford a smartphone. But it comes with all these amazing apps that are just helping you tremendously. So, yeah. So I have a follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. um, if you could tell us sort of which smartphones or what are the limits or because uh, my bet is most phones have a few Yes, yes. As far as I know, they're, they say general smartphones because they can refurbish any parts. Okay. Yeah, even if it's totally broken down and, you know, I don't know, they're as old as when the first ones came out. I don't even know when that was. It may be on the website, but it rings a bell for me. Yeah, but any parts, they can, yeah, they can even use any parts of them. Okay. So, That's yeah. very useful. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So you mentioned you're retired. Are you staying retired, or are you? I'm hoping not. I'm having too much energy. <laughs> this this jujitsu. I I I thought it was a peaceful person, you know, doing aikido. <laughs> but there's something about that violence that I, as, I don't like to. I don't ever like to hurt people. But all the assertive communication training that I've done and life coaching, you know, these guys. Every time I hit someone, they would make and I apologize. They would make me do ten push-ups. So it's, yeah, my shoulders are really hurting, so I have to stop <laughs> apologizing. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe I'll go back to work, we'll see. We'll see what opportunities come up. Yes. When you said you were getting your training certification, Yes, yes. So I assume that's a part-time job, potentially? That's potentially a part-time job. That's potentially a part-time job right there. Yeah. That could be, if I get enough students, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's amazing, I, I've, I've also been very, very fortunate um, in my career. Uh, one of several, several, several of my bosses that I have worked with, they were people who saw opportunities and not limitations. Um, for example, last year when I realized that I wanted to do self-defense and not martial arts. And there's a big difference between the two. Because if you're really good at one martial art and any martial art, if you're really, really good, you could probably use those skills to defend yourself if need be. But they're not necessarily meant for self-defense. And this here, the aim is practical and effective self-defense. There's a very big difference. Very, very big difference between the two. And I'm sorry, I was going somewhere with that. What was the question? <laughs> yes. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. So, yeah, perfect. So last year, I went to what I knew of martial arts. I went to Krav Maga. Uh, the theory is, is that you have two seconds. Someone's attacking you with a weapon, without a weapon. In two seconds, you have them down. And because it's a self-defense that's an attack. It's an aggressive self-defense system. And I went there and I talked to him. I called him up and I told him that I'm blind, but I do have martial arts background. And he told me to come and I did. But when I showed up, um, he told me that he can't help me because I will not see the punches coming in. And I mean, he's absolutely right. But I went home and I Googled practical and effective self-defense and what came up was Beset Jiu-Jitsu, which was actually really close to my house, luckily. And uh, I met a teacher who, he has never met anyone blind before, so he was unfortunate enough to meet me. And, but he seriously thought about it because he works in security and with law enforcement, and he's very passionate about empowering people. And he seriously kept on thinking about it, like, all right, okay, so you're without sight, someone's attacking you, what would really work? And then now we have a system that we're actually bringing forth to the CNIB for other clients too. So it's amazing that that was what was born out of just that. So, yeah. Can I just ask, you said you're between dogs. Yes. How, um, how do you qualify and how long does it take to get a dog? Uh, it's a lengthy application process. You know, they have to talk to you. They need to make sure that you're a responsible person and that it's going to make a good team. You can take care of a dog, which I'm a good, you know, I knew I would qualify because I had two 
long, I had two guide dogs and they both worked out great. I'm, you know, responsible. I know how to handle my dogs. Uh, it's a teamwork. It, the length, it really, really varies. Um, the CNIB, this is, for CNIB, this is a brand new program. They haven't had a guide dog, a service dog school before. Now they started this program last year. They launched it. I've been going to New York. That's one of North America's biggest and most trustworthy guide dog school. They have good aftercare. And how long, it really depends. Uh, most, school has, most schools have lengthy waiting periods, but it needs to work out for you. You need to be referred by your mobility instructor from the CNIB. And you need, as I said, you need to be already independent with your mobility. So you're not relying on the dog to go on auto drive because that's not how it works. It's teamwork. You have to give the dog directions. You. You're welcome. Hope I answered your question. <laughs> Do you give talks to students, like university students and stuff? Do you not yet. Yeah. I'm about to. <laughs> but I'd like to. Yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> Good. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that experience. It's actually, we're starting doing that, but they have a youth council. They have a youth council and they have youth groups, obviously, across Canada. You see the thing with uh, CNIB and the clients, majority of clients, and I'm not sure about the percentage, but most clients are quite elderly. So that makes up, I would even there say maybe 80 maybe more than 80% of the clients. So the young people, they come together in groups because they don't represent necessarily the, the main clientele of CNIB. The mentoring comes in anything and everything. And we're working with them, whether it's career skills, it's getting out into the world, um, even mobility skills. It's um, confidence. Whatever, whatever it might be. My, I've. So no, sorry, 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 sorry. It's all right. No. So say, is it true? I think I remember when I last time I was at CNIB, uh, they have a person now who will, who I think lives with low vision or no vision, who, if you suddenly lose your vision, will move into your house with you and show you how to navigate it? Um, I don't think they will. I haven't heard if that's the case, but I don't believe that they would move to your house but there's an independent living specialist who will come out to your house and help you navigate around your house and explain to you how you can do it alone. Um, they have come out to every apartment, every new apartment that I moved into. They helped me mark, you know, stoves and laundry machines. Um, you know, this is the normal, this is the <laughs> low, high, medium. They have these little sticker, sticky bumpers that you can feel you can put beside buttons so you know where the settings are. That's one of them. Um, and they come out to assess your whole home. You know, how can, you know, I don't know, uh, but if you're living in a place, let's say it's, uh, you know, it's a split level and there's no railing, well, that could be a big issue for someone who just all of a sudden you're blind. I mean, you get disoriented, which happens all the time even to me, and if there's a sudden drop like that, now that could be hazardous, so you need to do something about that. But there are a lot of things that you can change around in your home to make it user-friendly. I've lived alone for many years now. Um, it is possible. It's tough, it's really tough. There are some things that you, know, you will never be able to see, and one of my nightmares after living alone is uh, the toilet flooding. That's my biggest nightmares. <laughs> I'm terrified of that. <laughs> It's the worst thing that could happen <laughs> and you live alone. No sight at all. Like, oh my God. Um, I hope I answered your question, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But no, I don't think they move in with you. I would have probably heard of the program. They wouldn't stay out. No. Any more questions? Ask. Ask away. Anything. Well, I was happy to talk about any, if anybody's kind of got more kind of global questions about the United Way and how it works in the city. 
That's right, yeah. Too. Kevin knows about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I say that basically all of our 100 agencies would have any form, you know, lots of different forms of volunteer opportunities that would be specific to them. So if you had an area of passion, you'd be happy to volunteer up with an agency, you know, whether, whether it was doing homework for kids or, you know, mentoring, you know, newcomers or, you know, working with people with health conditions, you could break that up. Um, at United Way, one of our kind of, I think, coolest volunteer opportunities is um, our folks who are called our agency liaison volunteers. So they're folks who And same with the CNIB, there's just so many areas you can uh, volunteer to raise a puppy. <laughs> but then you have to give them up and they're about a year old, that that would be the toughest. Yeah. It's tough, it's tough. But that's probably one of the most, um, I think the highest rated volunteer opportunities. You can volunteer for the CNIB library and read books for recordings. Yeah, um, there are, there's actually a few programs in development currently. And one of them is sort of a, like, a, like a buddy system. Someone, you know, let's say, you know, I live in St. James and there happens to be someone who wants to volunteer and they would be my buddy. And when I have some help, I don't know, I have some mail, you know, I want to be read and, you know, my phone is not working or I need to go grocery shopping or, I don't know, I have an appointment somewhere and I just need some kind of help that I'm not able to get through CNIB or there's a waiting list or none of my family or my friends can help me. It's a buddy system, you know. I have a question. Um, you said like we could volunteer by reading books, like recording, so that um, clients can listen to the stories. Yes. Is there a volunteer coordinator that works just at CNIB? There is a volunteer coordinator, so yes. Yes, oh. yes, and they can give you more information, absolutely, oh, okay. absolutely. And then Kevin, I was just going to say with regards to the United Way volunteering opportunities, um, I work in the Office of Community Engagement here at the Faculty of Health Sciences. Oh, wonderful. And one of the things that we, uh, we've been talking about is United Way also has something called the Day of Caring. Mm, yeah. So we can get a bunch of people from the U of M, for example, to go to the Northern Women's Center and paint the exterior or paint the childcare room or whatever the agency needs. And the agency nice. is the one that informs us what we need. And then you just recruit a larger group to go out and do something for the community. Yeah, that's a great one. So that's a, that's a awesome. good one for like a large place great like you know. Yeah. We did that in the team building event on our last, on our last position. Oh, okay. So we took the team and went to the <coughs> Sounds like fun. It was awesome. It was 40 degrees out, but it was fun. <laughs> but it, yeah, but it was fun. I love those programs, you know, when everyone wins. It's such a, I'm sure it was an amazing experience, too. I don't know, great ideas can be, you know, can born at different places. The right people come together. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm wondering about how to find out. Is there a centralized place where we could find out about all of those programs in sure. one place? Um, well, I would say if you want to log into our website, you can look and see a 
across all of our agencies and have them categorized, categorized by their impact area. Um, if you're looking for one, like an agency specifically that I think does like a ton of work in that, that's actually really close by, is uh, Seed Winnipeg, which is just over the Salt Rap Tech Bridge. And they do tons of uh, financial empowerment uh, training and programming, and then also deploy a lot of their programming kind of No, we're good. I just wanted to thank you again okay. so much for having us on today. It was a real pleasure for me to be with you over this lunch hour. Thank you, thank you for having us, guys. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks.